Hi, this is Dr. Cockburner, and welcome to my video on an overview of Cronbach's coefficient alpha and McDonald's coefficient omega and when to use them. So if you're looking for a video on how to compute these coefficients, I would encourage you to look at the use the video link that's below above the comment box. Because the purpose of this video is to give an overview of the two different these two different options for computing reliability and when you should use each one. So I'll start by talking in briefly about internal consistency reliability as a whole. And internal consistency has to do with how the items relate to each other. So in many ways, it's the reliability within the test. And when I say reliability, of course, I mean consistency between test scores. And this is a particularly popular form of reliability evidence in social sciences research and in psychometrics when you only have one test administration. So in other words, you give uh, a test or a survey to one sample of participants and the design is cross-sectional or you only collect data from them at that one point in time. So some examples of reliability coefficients or internal consistency reliability coefficients are listed here. And again, in this video, I'm gonna focus on Cronbach's coefficient alpha and McDonald's coefficient omega, but there are a number of other options as well. So I'll start with Cronbach's coefficient alpha, and this is by far the most popular estimate of internal consistency reliability across the social sciences. And I remember I read somewhere in an article in genetic research that Lee Cronbach's famous 1951 article on coefficient alpha has been cited more times than the double helix model of DNA. So very popular, widely used. And Lee Kronbach is oftentimes given credit for developing or deriving the coefficient alpha formula, although he never actually claims credit. But what Lee Kronbach did was make an adjustment to the existing Cooter-Richardson 20 formula. And the, the KR20 was developed in the 1930s. And the KR20 gives you an average of all possible split half combinations of test scores. So let's say, for example, you have a test that has 10 items on it. One way you can divide them in half and correlate them together to get a reliability estimate is to use the first five questions correlated with the second five questions. You might also do even numbered questions and odd numbered questions and correlate them together. And there's a number of other possible options. So the KR20 is the average of all possible split half combinations for scales that have dichotomous anchor definitions. So in other words, where respondents to the test have two choices, so they could say it's either true or false, yes or no, correct or incorrect, and so on and so forth. So that's the KR20, all possible split half combinations to dichotomously scaled items. What Lee Kronbach did was make an adjustment to the KR20, which he originally named Alpha, and Alpha extends the KR20 because it's the same idea where it's the mean of all possible split half combinations but for items that have three or more response options or anchor definitions. So you could have a scale that would be yes, maybe, or no. It could be that um, widely used five point scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So it extends the utility of the KR20 to scales that have three or more response options. And as I mentioned, Lee Kronbach named the adjusted version of the KR20 alpha, and then over the years it evolved to really one of three names in coefficient alpha, Kronbach's coefficient alpha, or Kronbach's alpha. And that was largely because a number of other conce concepts and statistics are already called alpha, so this helped to distinguish this coefficient um, from the others. So McDonald's Omega, I wouldn't say is new, it's been around for decades, uh, but it's been widely underused in social sciences research up until perhaps recently. And what Roderick McDonald did was to develop what's called a composite reliability estimate. So McDonald's Omega is a type of composite reliability estimate, and really Omega is a generalized form of alpha. So for although it's oftentimes overlooked, coefficient alpha is subject to the data meeting a number of statistical assumptions. And I'll share those assumptions with you in a little while. But what Omega does is it is robust, or it stands up to the majority of the assumptions that alpha is vulnerable to. So where alpha is dependent on the data meeting certain assumptions, omega is not. And when I say generalized form, what I mean is that alpha and omega will be the exact same number when the data meet all of alpha's assumptions. And at a basic level, what Omega does is it extends the utility of alpha for use with congeneric scales. 
So in other words, it means that congenere sales involve that all test items do contribute to the overall reliability or stability of test scores, but they do so in different degrees or in different amounts. And the example I like to use is comparing the test to going to the grocery store. So think of when you go to the grocery store, each of the items that you buy, each of the food items you buy, that'll be comparable to the test questions in this example. So if you go to the grocery store and you buy 10 grocery items, more often than not, at least in my experience, the items don't cost the exact same amount of money. There's going to be differences in their cost. And similarly, most of the time when we use attitudinal scales in social sciences research, each of the test items, they contribute to the overall reliability of scores, but they do so with varying degrees of precision. So for example, what Omega will do if we have, if we go to the grocery store and buy a steak and a banana, coefficient alpha is going to assume the steak and banana cost the same amount or that they contribute the same amount of stability to test scores, where coefficient omega is going to give more weight to the steak or it's going to give more weight to the items that contribute more to the stability of, of, of scores. So I want to go over quickly a, a flow chart from an article that I wrote recently. And I'll put a link to the article um, above the chat box below. And I'll also put my email address there. So if you'd like a copy, just send me an email and I'd be happy to, to send it to you. And this isn't just self-advertising or yes, I wrote the article, but my sincere purpose was to provide a one-stop shop or kind of a guide that you can use to see, okay, I have test scores. I'm either evaluating scores on an existing test for use with, with clients or research participants, or you're doing your own research. So I'm hoping this, this article can be a guide to help you do that. So one example here in this figure, one thing to look at when trying to determine, okay, what's the most appropriate internal consistency reliability index for me is first to look at, do we have what's called a unit weighted scale? And a unit weighted scale means that the correlations between the items and the total construct are going to vary. And in most social sciences research, when we use scales that are based on classical test theory, they're going to be unit weighted scales. So if we meet the unit weighted scale assumption, then we want to look for the dimensionality of the scale. And for both alpha and omega, you need to have what's called a unidimensional scale. So I'm going to pull up a example to talk about this in a little bit more detail. So this is a psychometric study on the FSV or the fit stigma and value scale. And FSV are three barriers to counseling or reasons why people might be reluctant to seek counseling services. So it is both a unidimensional and multidimensional measure depending on how you use it. So in a unidimensional sense, we have three subscales being fit. So this is a barrier to counseling that's based on one's belief that counseling isn't going to be consistent with my personality or my personal belief. It's not going to be a good fit with me and, and who I am. Also stigma. So these are feelings of shame and embarrassment that are related to going to counseling. And then finally value or the belief that the amount of effort it would take to attend counseling is not going to be worth the benefits that are going to come from it. So I could use in a unidimensional sense, either coefficient alpha or omega to estimate the reliability of any one of these single order scales. However, this scale also comprises what's called a higher order factor, or there's a general global barriers to seeking counseling that's multidimensional in nature. So for the higher order factor, it would be inappropriate to use alpha or omega to estimate reliability because it's a multidimensional measure when we're looking at test scores. So in that case, it would be appropriate to use omega hierarchical, which I won't really talk about in this video. I won't really mention it at all, actually. But essentially, this is just an extension of omega for multidimensional scales. And I do talk about it more in the article that's linked below. So if we meet the unit weighted scale and unidimensional scale, the next thing they look for is a normal distribution of scores. And some of you might be familiar with this already. If you look at that symmetrical mountain shaped bell curve, or it's also called the Gaussian curve, it's a notion that scores represent a normal distribution. And in a truly normal distribution, your mean, median, and mode are the exact same number, which almost never happens, or I've never had that happen in, in actual practice of research. So the question becomes, well, does your sample data, do the scores represent a normal distribution closely enough that it's appropriate to compute statistics that are based on a normal distribution? And for coefficient alpha, it's particularly important that scores are normally distributed.
So I won't go into details about how to determine this now, but in the article that's linked below, I do give some very specific criteria and guidelines you can look at to determine whether or not scores are normally distributed closely enough to use alpha. However, assuming that the scores are normally distributed, the next assumption to look for is called essential tau equivalence. And this is the notion that we, we talked about earlier with the congeneric scales, that although each test item contribute stability or they contribute an amount of reliability, so to speak, to scores, they do so with varying degrees of precision. So if the data are not essentially tau equivalent, then it's inappropriate to use coefficient alpha. So one of the ways to check for tau equivalence is to look at standardized loadings in a factor analysis. So we'll go back to our, our path model here. And oftentimes, if you look at a test manual or a journal article, you might find a path model like this for the FSV scale. I've also seen them in tables uh, in, in some publications. But what we're looking for here are these values here, the standardized factor loadings. And for each scale, the data tend to be re robust to tau equivalence, or in other words, it's OK to compute alpha if the mean factor loading on this scale, so let's look at the FIT scale, for example. So if this factor loading here is at least 0.7, the average score across all these items is 0.7, and the difference between each item's loadings are between negative 0.2 and 0.2, if those assumptions are met, or that's met in the factor loadings, then it's OK to use coefficient alpha, or the data meet that assumption of essential tau equivalence. If not, it's appropriate to compute omega and not so much alpha. And then if we do meet essential tau equivalence, then we're looking at the scale of measurement. So this has to do with the anchor definitions. So for each, uh, each test item, how are the options scaled? So for coefficient alpha, it's designed to be used for a continuous level scale of measurement. So that's what's called an interval or a ratio scale, or the notion that the differences between scale points is exact and precise. And a lot of times in social sciences research, particularly in counseling and psychology, you might use a scale that's on that classic ordinal rank scale between strongly agree and strongly disagree. And I've sometimes seen that type of scale treated like it's continuous level data, when in fact it's actually ordinal data. So let's say, for example, I ask participants to rate on a scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree with the following statement. I love internal consistency reliability. So if someone says five strongly agree, and someone else says four agree, we know that the person that says strongly agree agrees with the statement more than the person that says just agree, but we don't know how much more. So because we don't know precisely how much more, we don't have the precise difference between the scale points, so data are on an ordinal scale. So if we don't have a continuous level scale of measurement, it's still possible to use alpha. However, we should have at least five or more scale points and a large sample. And that's because a number of simulation studies have shown that with a large sample and five or more scale points, ordinal data behaves in a way that's comparable to continuous level data, or it's at least close enough in this case to compute coefficient alpha. And then finally, if we meet this assumption here, we were going to look for uncorrelated error. So the idea here is that the correlations between the error terms um, are, they're, they're, there's not a correlation between them because Depending on how errors are correlated, alpha can either underestimate or overestimate the reliability estimate of scores. So if we meet all these assumptions, we can compute alpha or omega. So my recommendation is if you're doing your own research or you're looking at existing research to see does this scale have sufficient reliability evidence for use with your clients or research participants, I think it's important to either report this process of assumption checking if we're only going to report alpha or report both coefficients alpha and coefficients omega. And I can say from my own experience, and I, there's other findings from the literature that support this, that oftentimes there's not that much of a difference between alpha and omega. So the data usually are closely enough to uh, meeting alpha, alpha's assumptions to compute either one, but that's not always going to be the case. So in the, in the event that someone does not do or go through each of these assumptions for alpha, it's important to compute both and then present them both to the reader. And I also should say that statisticians aren't in 100% agreement on the assumptions for coefficient alpha, but I can tell you based on a recent review of the literature, these are the main ones that are cited um, across different studies or by more than one author. All right, well, that concludes this video. Thank you for your time and attention, and I hope you found it helpful.